Yeah. <laughs> well, hello, welcome, and thank you for welcoming me here. My name is Beth I'm from Michigan State University. I'm an assistant professor of second language studies and German there. And my main area of research interest and practice interest is teaching with technology. So that's what I do. And I was very happy to be here this morning to learn all of the tools that you guys have been working on. Some of them I knew about, some of them I didn't, so that's always very exciting. Is there any way to get the light up front a little bit better so yeah. the screen is more visible? It looks impressive. There's a lot of buttons, so. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 not mine. <laughs> not mine either. Somebody just got up. Somebody sounds on. Mixing it all up and mixing it all up because when we think of blended instruction, even though we haven't been doing blended instruction for a long time, you might be thinking of a model of we'll replace two classes with online, and so now my teacher can teach two sections. And that's in part what we'll be talking about today, but in part not. So just wanted to clarify that. So what will we be talking about? First of all, blended learning, what is it? Am I in your screen? I'm not used to screen. Um, <coughs> why should we blend? Or why do people blend? Sometimes the reasons why they do things is not necessarily why we should do them. Does it work? And needs analysis before we ever start, which is a step that is sometimes forgotten. And then really the majority of the presentation will be sort of a walk through our German curriculum at Michigan State and how we've gone about technology enhanced language instruction, the lessons we've learned, and then hopefully some question time, a lot of question time so that you can ask me and uh, I can ask you too. So, blended versus hybrid. I think I've heard hybrid earlier today. I call it blended. I'm not alone in this, I didn't come up with it. But <laughs> I prefer to blend the term blended because blended captures what I'm after in blended learning, which is you take different things, you mix them together, and the result is something smooth. Hybrid to me sounds like the Toyota Prius, and I'm sorry if anybody has one. I don't find that a pretty car. I like Toyota drive one myself, but the Prius, not my favorite car. And it sort of has that mechanical, we have two components, and we're gonna be really effective, but it just doesn't sound smooth and pretty. So I like blended, but if you like hybrid, I'm fine with that too. So what is it? In simple terms, and I think you already all know that, some instructions happens in a face-to-face -face environment, some instruction happens online. Now, my colleague Paula Winky and I came up with a little bit more of a layered definition, sort of a continuum, starting with a traditional class that really has no online component. You have a textbook, you work face to face, you don't do anything online, and you may not even use any technology in the classroom, which that scares me. Or auxiliary, which is the next step up. You have some extra practice activities that you tell your students about, and you maybe have even the syllabus on the course management system. You never really look at it, your students never really look at it, and it's not integrated in your course. That's Sort of, it's there, you could think about it, but we don't use it. Most of what I'll talk about is technology enhanced, which is the use of some technology in the class and for homeworks and tests and additional practice and more resources, but it's less than 30% of the work that is online. Now, the blended done to me is 30 to 90% of the work is completed or delivered online. And then online is 90% and above. My university doesn't believe in this definition. They call the course online, then 50% of the instruction happens online. It's a little misleading. So everybody has different de definitions. These are the definitions that I'll be working with today. So um, we made them up, we stuck to them. So why do people blend? Well, space. I've heard that you are in a similar situation as most campuses across the country. We run out of space. I heard you guys have a mountain in the way. Um, we don't really, we have a budget problem <laughs> in our place. 
Um, you know, Michigan auto economy is not doing so hot. So uh, we have a little bit of a financial problem, even though we have a lot of acreage. We don't really have buildings on that acreage. Uh, and part of it is because we have forests and cows and stuff. So we don't have buildings there. And we fight over the space. And so to blend then means, well, if I teach my course face-to-face you know, -face Monday, Tuesday, and you teach yours Thursday, Friday, we can both share the same classroom. And so that makes administrators happy. Costs, especially if you take the more traditional lending method of assigning an instructor several courses, then now you save money. You may actually also make more money because you might get more learners. So for example, we have a pretty strong, less commonly taught languages program, and some of our languages are, you know, strong as we have maybe three students, and <laughs> but that's not really enough to run a full class, but maybe Penn State has another three, and maybe University of Wisconsin has another four, so we can work together and make one course, and, and that way we have a course. Another option, of course, is um, we have a lot of people that got laid off in our state and are getting some federal funding to take additional courses. Well, they might not be able to come from Flint to East Lansing, but they can stay there and where we are, where we are or maybe they only have to drive down one time a week. So if they have other commitments that prevent them from either physically being there or, you know, because of the distance or the time, um, we can offer that with blended or online learning. So we can get more learners and thereby bring in more revenue. And like I said, we have opportunities to work across institutions. So that's sort of the typical reasons. Now my program is a little bit different. They try to be a German. We really thought, well, let's think about it differently. Articulation, when we asked our peer institutions why they blended, or why they saw the benefits of blending, a lot of them said that articulation was a big factor. Because suddenly, if I blend my 200 level courses, which in your case is 2,000, I think, so <clears throat> now I have a fixed set of materials that my students have, that the students have to work on. Now whether you, you, or you teach the course, it doesn't matter, it's the same activities. So now I have more coherence across sections. At the same time, what we worked on is that we made sure that we had also of moving upwards articulation so that we use the same kinds of technologies and, and we increase the technologies. And you have to communicate a lot more in order to make it effective, which then hopefully leads to better articulation. We also wanted better learning outcomes. We said there's got to be things for which technology is better suited than face-to-face. -face. And then there's peer pressure. And that was really the Dean's mo biggest motivation because Everybody else, when we asked around, everybody else was doing it, so we got to do it too. Now, we also have a particular new incentive at our institution, and that is that the university cost shares with us, um, or revenue gives back, if we teach online courses in the, um, in the summer. So we get the revenues back, or a large portion of it. So that has created um, the, the incentive to go online or in blended format, which has actually made our course management system completely overload and crash for most of the beginning of the semester in the fall because too many too many sets uh, too many units use that as the solution for the 24 percent budget cut so that's where we're at does it work i can't pronounce her name which is strange <laughs> maya found out and when she reviewed 25 different studies that really blended is as effective if not more looking at all language skills and it's a little bit biased because, of course, the one studies that are being reported on are the ones that worked well. When we compared, we went a little bit more in depth and looked at different studies. Um, yeah, enrollment increased, costs were saved, class sizes went down, language gains were similar. Sometimes there were differences, but it wasn't clear whether it was the delivery system or just other logistical changes. Student and teacher satisfaction was very mixed. There were tons of technological problems usually, and it required a lot of time from all the stakeholders, which can be seen good or bad. Obviously it's bad if it takes a lot of time from the coordinator and the teacher, but it, they also found, um, for example, Rob Sanders found that, that um, the students were spending more time on task. Now, that might be bad. They might feel bad about it because they feel like they're putting in more time, but it might be good for that language learning because they're putting in more time. 
So, this is not mine, but it was pretty, so I used it. I give you a reference where I got it. So, before we start learning, needs analysis needs to happen. You need to know your learners. Who are they? What do they do? What do they want to know? What do they have access to? What do they want to get out of the course? And so on and so forth. Learning outcomes, what do you want the learners to be able to do? And technology gives us an opportunity to think about our learning goals beyond the language proficiency. Maybe you also want to teach them computer literacy. Maybe you also want to teach them um, self-reliance, self-responsibility, time management, and so on and so forth. Blend it as a good opportunity for that. What other issues are unique to this context that you should consider? These were, for example, how blended instruction is supported, how it is rewarded, um, what resources you have available, and then the big question is the organization ready and supportive of blended options. Our institution is supportive. Is it ready? No. As we saw in the fall, where just our whole course management was pretty much out. So that was not so much a problem for me teaching a technology enhanced course, but it was a big problem for those teaching blended or online where everything was housed within the course management system, so now they didn't have class for three weeks. Or, you know, it worked for five minutes and then it was off for five minutes, so that didn't work very well. Are there any barriers to the technology-based delivery? What infrastructure do you have? Do you have enough server space? Do you have people like you guys have here that can help you and hold your hand when you come crying? Do you have support teams for your students? Do your students actually have access to computers? And then the most important question, what is best taught online and what is best taught face-to-face? -face? And I don't have the answer for that. I'm still playing. So, our story. First, we looked at what do we know. So we looked at the research that's already out there. Then we went and we asked our peers the other Big Ten institutions. What are you doing? What are you? Why are you doing it? What are the problems? What are the benefits? And they told us, which is very nice. And we published it, so you can learn too. So, um, and I'd be happy to share the references at the end. And then we conducted a needs analysis of our learners. We sent a paper-based survey to all of our undergrads enrolled in foreign language classes. We're a university of about 50,000. So the survey was sent to about 4,000 students. We got over 2,000 back. And they weren't as ready as we thought. Um, access to microphones, not so much. Access to webcams, not so much. Knowing how to deal with audio and video files, mm, not really. Um, computer, no problem. Some had Mac, some had PC. Um, you know, headsets, usually no problem. Did they have an, a fancy phone? Of course they did. Um, so those were mixed, mixed results. Really, for a lot of the things we wanted to do, they weren't ready, but for a lot of other things, they, they, they did have some level of readiness. We also asked them if they wanted to have blended, blended foreign and language instruction, and about a third said yes, a third said maybe, and a third said no, absolutely not. So we have used that as a guideline in terms of how many courses we blend, because we don't want to leave the ones that absolutely do not want to be in a blended course with no other option. And then we looked at who else is blending on campus, how are they doing it, what are their successes, challenges, and then we looked at materials. And this is maybe a little bit of a, where our students can reach it. We have some that will reach higher, and we definitely have a lot that need to reach lower. Problem is, the Department of Education in Michigan sets this as the goal for the people that go into teaching, so we have to set that too. So we reflect. But it also is in line with what some other institutions are expecting. So, now we start the tour. Join me on my tour through German at Michigan State University. If you come to us as a freshman, you will start with German 100, which is a technology enhanced course with a textbook called Vorsprung, and the Kia online workbook goes with it. It also has streamed video and listening activities that they do on their own visualize this and it ha um, they meet well they meet four days a week and then the fifth one is self-study and it's always been that way it's not necessarily anything online it's just self-study so what we do in a face-to-face -face, oh these colors look very different on your screen you have pretty colors of mine 
They are green, red, and yellow, and match the colors of my blender. Oh. But oh, you imagine that. So um, we do material presentation, grammar presentation, working with the text, and so on in class. We do four skills, integrated skills with them. We work with the textbooks. That all happens face to face. Testing happens in class and online. Our midterm and the final is face to face, but the speaking component of it is online using a tool called Conversation that the Center for Language Education and Research has developed. And I'll give you more information about that later. And then quizzes are all within the course management system. So self graded, dumping the grades automatically into the gradebook in the course management system. You don't have to worry about it. They cheat, it's okay. And for homework, they work with the Kia workbook, the video segment, the videos, the street video, and the manual that goes with that. All of that online. Again, self grading, we don't really have to worry about it. Except that, of course, the Kia workbook doesn't dump automatically into our gradebook because it's, it's a vendor product. So, German 200, <coughs> technology enhanced war blended. Um, in the blended version, we moved all the, the reading, listening, and viewing outside of the class. Do that on your own time. We do the pre-reading and the post-reading, but the actual reading you do on your own. And then we have added more computer-mediated communication activities. And we'll replace one or two of the four teaching days with an online day. And it sort of depends on the instructor. We work <coughs> with a textbook called Stationen, which has a lot of online materials already, which makes it very easy to work with for a blended environment. It, um, so station in the stations, that's the like train stations. Each chapter talks about a different city in a German-speaking country. So it's kind of neat how it goes through it. And then it has a video blog that goes with it. And so we work with the Kia, the DVD, and then we have developed some computer-mediated communication activities to go along with it. This is how it looks. Again, material presentation, four skills work, textbook and DVD, happens in face-to-face -face or a mixture if you're in the blended section. The testing, again, is pretty much the same as in 100, except that uh, we're using also now audio drop boxes. So conversations is simulated conversations. Audio drop boxes is more monologues, so they have to produce longer speaking responses. Homework, again, the Kia workbook, the DVDs, CMC activities, so chat, discussion forum, blog, wikis, sort of up to the teacher what, they, what mixture they come up with but it usually includes a blog and a chat. And then we have an online self-evaluation form, which is 12 questions, nine of them about their participation, and three of them where they give us feedback about how they are doing, feeling in the course, how they think we're doing, and they do that every week, and it grades itself. It dumps into the grade book. Then they have to do essays, and you know, that's just essays, nothing you said. And then they have to do a multimedia presentation, meaning it has to be text, pictures, and it has to be animated. But they present it live in class. And it has to be a presentation, they have to do kind of like a textbook, a station of where they're from. So they will present Rochester, Michigan, or Ann Arbor, Michigan, or whatever they might be from. Most of our students are from Rochester, Michigan. So it gets a little boring because you have 28 <laughs> students and 15 are about Rochester. So I have allowed them to work together if they're all from Rochester. So that's what happened. So we did a trial study. Um, we found, unfortunately, no significant differences in computer literacy development or language development. So I guess it doesn't really matter what you do. Um, teacher was unhappy as can be. Students were unhappy, which is, of course, if the teacher is unhappy about what they're doing, how could the students be happy? So what we've learned from that is that you really need to have a teacher who believes in technology. Otherwise, you're shooting yourself in your own foot. So next semester, it'll be me. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. And uh, so German 300, which is sort of my baby, I created this now, so I feel very attached to it. It's technology enhanced. It works with a textbook called Anders Gedacht, Thinking Differently, which is divided into sort of two themes in the book. One is um, history, history of German-speaking countries, and the other one is contemporary German identity. So it's about multicultural Germany, East and West coming together, those kinds of topics. Unfortunately, it doesn't have a Kia workbook, but we have Kia-fied it a little bit. 
it just came out with a new edition, and we're probably going to put the, the workbook online just within our course management system to make it a little bit better. We also do two movies with them per semester and one novel. Class meets three days a week, which is why we don't mind. Here is what we do. Material presentation and four skills work, work with the materials all face to face. Testing is now all either in the lab or at home. So the midterm and the final are actually in the course management system great themselves for the most part, except for the open-ended stuff, of course. But we do it in the lab for test security, because uh, you know, they count. And then, again, the quizzes are all online in the course management system. The homework is workbook, chat activities, again, the online self-evaluations. They have to peer review each other. And then we also work with mashups, which is you know little activities with videos and audio and so on. Then they have three multimedia presentations, either on the team, theme of identity or history, depending on the semester. And again, this is um, text, pictures, and the animation. And they have to now no longer present it live in class. So you don't have to sit through 27 of the same presentations. Instead, they do this online. And so actually that's what they're doing right now. My students are uploading their part three right now into the course management system. So we had half class today, obviously, I'm here, they're there. But that's typical for these days. Um, and so they upload it, and then they have to give each other feedback, and they have to give each other grades. And they vote for the best project. The best project gets um, a free homework assignment or something that I decide. Um, and then they also have to write traditional essays. But again, they do, will go through a peer review process there during an online class period. So we, we do have a few in there um, that where we replace the face-to-face -face meeting with sitting in front of the computer at the same time, but in our own world. So here is a typical class period from um, German 302. This was last week. We're working with the novel. So you see here I pulled up the, on the course management side the worksheet that they're working on. Projected on the screen, I don't think you can see, but I wrote some stuff on the board that the students were feeding me as we were working together. Um, if it's notes that are in response to the, the worksheet, I put it right onto the worksheet and then load it back up into the course management system. You see them here, they all have, not all, but most of them have their netbooks or their, their laptops out. They're working together in groups. They have their um, worksheet out, some printed it out. Some are pulling it up on a course management system. Um, and then she's looking up words on Leo. And some of them are also um, have their notes from when they were reading open. And they're working together as a team there. And then here, you see she is obviously somebody who prefers to write handwritten notes. She hand wrote them and is continuing to keep the handwriting. She wants them online. She's writing online. He's doing a dual approach, and he also has like four different screens open on his laptop. So the, the dictionary, Google, just in case, <laughs> because you never know what Google can tell you. Um, the worksheet, and then um, I think just our general calendar. And then here, these are, I see more and more iPhones in the classroom. So here's um, Sam. She's looking up a word for um, whatever they're looking for the word that they needed for discussion. She's looking it up and then she's showing it to him, look, this is what it means. Which with a laptop is a little bit more cumbersome, you know, as a bigger machine. So with the iPhone, it works really well. And I was a little nervous because this year was sort of the arrival of the iPhone on Michigan State campus. It seemed like suddenly there were a lot more students using it and they all whipped it out at the beginning of class and I go, oh God, now everybody's going to text, nobody's going to pay attention to me. But as long as I keep them busy, they use it for class purposes for about 90% of the time, which is, you know, if you're done with the activity and you use that time to phone a friend, fine. And they do text a friend to you, kind of like, you know, help, I don't get it, and that's fine too. Um, they, can, they can use it for other purposes. So, let me show you a sample project. So this is part one of the identity project, and they have to describe who they are and how they became who they are today. Part two would be what is German, what is American, <coughs> and how are those identities formed. 
And then part three is what is identity, how is identity formed?
they get the better of two grades, the average of the student grades or my grade. Um, my 400 level course thought that, that was totally unfair and not going to work, so they wanted the average of their grades, and it was me and the TA, and the average of our two grades, and then the average of that, that should be their grades. So that's what they negotiated. It's always different. We, we go with the flow. So far in the pedal, language class in 400, it was blended according by topic. So it didn't really save cost, didn't save space, didn't help my dean at all, but it made me happy. We had no textbook, all online materials, accompanying worksheets. Um, we worked in the four skills. We had a lot of technology because the, the theme was media. There was an entire four week period, period where we worked on social media where they were on their own. They went into chat, Facebook, um, Second Live. They worked with a lot of the Goethe Institute materials. We did polls, we worked with databases. And so they were on their own. It was a little scary. I didn't see them for four weeks. Yeah. Um, we, we sent them a lot of polls, like two, three times a week. You know, we'd get an email from a student that gave us an indication of how things are going overall. So then we made a new little poll question and saw how people were following, just checking in with them, reminding that they're still supposed to have German class. They're just supposed to work on their own. So it was uh, face to face or online, depending on the topic. Usually the homework was also with technology, conversation, blog entries, their self participation form, and so on. There's no more formal testing at 400 level. And then they were supposed to complete three out of four major multimedia projects. They could choose which four, or they could do all four, and then the lowest grade gets dropped. And um, they did two drafts of it, and they had to write an interpretation of their presentation as if they were somebody else. So, because they have to write more at that level. And the, uh, the four projects were an ad campaign, a movie critique, a, m a music video, where they actually wrote the sounds, and a documentary. Those were the different things. And they wrote a research paper and they co-wrote with us the grading criteria. So we put out a draft and then they made changes to it as they felt was best. And it's interesting, they have very different ideas of how grades should come up than we do. They were actually way stricter than we were. And so after, remember the four weeks where we just let them go? After they came back, we gave them a survey, we asked them a lot of questions and we asked them to draw their experience. And this is one drawing. So this is, I think it was Scott. So this is Scott on his computer, and he's freaking out because there's all these things that he's supposed to be doing, and he knows he was supposed to do them over four weeks, but of course he waited until Sunday before class, right? So now he's freaking out. And they had to then present their drawing to a, a small group. And the theme throughout the entire class was, I really learned time management in this. I really learned that I was not good at it and I had to work hard. And no, it was not too much work even though it felt like it, but it was my fault that it felt like it. And that was a great realization that these students had, that we, we weren't to blame. And so we liked that. And then, this is my sample project. So this is an ad campaign. we give you a little bit of background story here. So. Um, they could do a real project product or a fake one. This student chose to do a fake one. Um, if you've never been to Germany, some of the regions in Germany, like the one I'm from, has a little bit of a thick dialect. And it's very hard to understand, and there's big differences between the city and, and the rural area. So he came up with this product that is a translator from dialect to standard German. <coughs> it's very easy. And he made it in the form of a little, well, you'll see a little fish, but then you'll see something that you might not recognize. But the traditional hat in my area is this hat with these red balls on top of it. So you'll recognize that in a second. But, and uh, there you see two characters. One is the mayor of my hometown, and, which is, of course, the city. And then you'll see the farmer from the countryside. And if you know German, then maybe even your Ja, bei Ihnen passiert, dass Sie ein Bank der Bauer zu hier, aber gar nichts verstehen können. Weißt du was? Wenn ein Prüger Wabel und Kohle so sie auch nicht verstoßen? Ähm, nein. Jetzt haben wir die Lösung. Der Badenerfisch. Mit der Badenerfisch kannst du auch Badisch verstehen. Ein Gottesgabe. Stell dich 
Danke, der Bayerische Fisch. Ein Tag in den Gehörgang ein. Das war super einfach. And I think that would be really great if that existed. <laughs> you know, I just like plug it in your ear and then it translates for you. So that was just his idea. And um, he talked about why he chose those characters in his interpretive essay. You know, the, the mayor is famous for being a little bit snotty and not really acknowledging there's, there's the countryside outside. So, you know, he had, he had studied abroad there and he picked up a lot of the little nuances very well. And the lessons we learned from that is pretty much the same as for, for 300. The biggest difference is that they really worked with time management skills and independence in their language learning. They learned about a lot of tools that they can access once they leave us and no longer have language courses, which is another good advantage. And they also appreciated having choices in the curriculum and the blended format really helped us allowing them to be very flexible. So, for our level literature class, I don't really feel comfortable saying too much about it because it's somebody else's dissertation, even though I was on her committee, and I really know the dissertation, but it's her work, so I feel like I'm stealing it if I talk about it. But I'll share anyway. So it's a literature class, and she's blending because she thinks there should be more language focus in the literature course. They need more language work. So a lot of that she does using online tools. For example, she put all the texts, she read all the texts and recorded them, all of the second and primary texts, so that the students could hear how they sound while they read to help them with their comprehension. And um, yeah, you can see her dissertation from more details. So pre, pre during and post reading happens in class, but the language work happens online, literary analysis, cultural discussion, but then again, a lot of that where you're actually working on the language skills is online. Some of our literature courses have testing, um, this particular course really only had conversations online where again, they were asked questions about the tasks, the text, and they had to talk about them. Um, they did a blog, discussion forums, wikis, mashups, the readings, those were sort of their homeworks. They also had multimedia presentations just like in the language class. The course was on fairy tales, so it had something to do with fairy tales, I can't remember. They wrote essays, but then they also wrote, they, they co-wrote a wiki about the topic, which was very neat, and they had an actual audience, which was um, a high school class in Germany. And they also did peer feedback and peer reading. And again, all of that happened online. So what did we learn from that? Students' language improved. We, don't, we didn't have a comparison, so we don't know if more, but the students got the impression that they did improve more. Um, the focus on language in the literature class was successful. The students' opinions were mixed, but mostly positive. It was interesting that it wasn't necessarily the students with the best technology skills that had the most positive experience, which is what we expected, so we didn't get that concern. Again, they recorded a greater sense of community, <coughs> too many activities, and also the collaboration. So for example, when they wrote the wiki together or when they did the multimedia projects together, they weren't necessarily collaborating, they were cooperating a lot of times. Like, you do this part, you do this part, and you do that part. So they parceled it out and then they stuck it back together and it was not a coherent, cohesive, nice product. So we're working a lot on refining our grading criteria so that we can force them into a more collaborative spirit. And then many features go unused. Um, my colleagues spend a lot of time giving them feedback on their oral um, recordings and they never looked on it. But that was another thing that, you know, the course management system tracks that all. She looked at it and she's like, well, if they're not going to use it, there's no point in me spending hours and hours with that. So, sum it up. Work online when it makes sense, but don't if it doesn't. Seems very logical. Um, speaking activities, and you've seen several examples this morning too, can be done more easily now online and they can be very effective. The multimedia group presentations are very good to develop several different skill sets. And um, technology can be used to give and receive feedback very quickly and easily. Decide what you want to accomplish and then pick the tool rather than the other way around. Sometimes it's okay to find a tool and go, oh, this is really cool, I'm going to try it out, and try it out, and then figure out, okay, it works for this purpose. Um, remind students that they still have to work X hours, even though some
some of it is no longer happening face to face. They sometimes forget. They now feel like it should only be two hours a week that they have to work when it's a four credit course. But also make sure that it's not too much that you assign and see their technology as your friend. Learn from them. And I think I've heard that a few times already this morning too, that you learn from them what they're doing and then figure out how you can integrate that into your teaching. Let go of control. That's hard. And put them in charge. Gradually increase the degree of technology from first year until fourth year so that they become slowly familiar with the tools and gain more independence. And at this point, I can show you more documents if you want to, more examples, or tell you about different classes that are outside of this curriculum, like our graduate courses or something, or our general education courses. And you know, I want to stay here. So thank you so far. Happy to answer questions, comments, show more. I, I was actually wondering about the graduate courses. Uh -huh. what does it like, um, so what we do with our graduate courses is, is discussion forums is one of the prime things we use just because that allows us, because often they're just once a week, so it allows us to stay in connection with them from one week to the other. They have to read earlier than the day before because they have to think about the readings already before, so that's a big, big piece of it. Um, I'm doing, I. I, well, I teach several grad courses, but the two where I'm blending is a technology course. That doesn't make sense, right? Teaching about technology blended. And then the other one is a program administration course, where I teach people how to be um, board language program coordinators. And I'll talk about that one first, because we just did that. So there, um, we had a lot of guest presenters come from around the country, around the world, actually, via um, video conferencing, and we recorded those sessions. And so I'm creating a database of lectures and in subsequent semesters. This is the problem with blending. You sometimes have to have one group of students suffer so that like following generations can be happy. So these students had to watch all kinds of presentations that weren't relevant for them. So like poor student who is going to go back to Japan and teach English in a K-12 system there had to listen to all of these presentations about the American context. I didn't want to avoid that in the future. So what I'm going to do in the future is okay, you watched a presentation about teaching EFL around the world, and here's five links, versus, you know, Katrina, who is going to be um, a Spanish language coordinator, you're going to watch these college language coordinators' presentations. So that's how we did that, and then they interacted with them also via the, the video conferencing. Sometimes we did it where we were in the same room, which worked, in terms of we could check in with each other, it failed in the sense of the technology because we were we were overriding each other with our microphones and we echoed like crazy. So that was um, the downside of it. But um, in the future, that could be done on um, individually. The the call course similar. We have people come in from outside. What I'd like to do the next time I teach the course is collaborate with another call course so that we can exchange ideas. And then um, the, the biggest new trial is going to be not really blended so much as self-study. And I will um, not have certain class periods, but give them a list of workshops and presentations on campus and tell them you need to complete five of these and then come back and kind of like what you did today. That's exactly what my students will do. Here, learn, learn tools, these lists of workshops, come back and teach the other people Five of the, one of these five that you learned and how you used it for your teaching. And it could be either teaching or the back end of teaching, which is grading and so on and so forth, or it's planning. So that's that's what we're gonna do there. And then a lot of, like I said, we're getting more and more computer students, especially in the graduate level. So we're, we're taping more and more of our classes and putting them online for students that are not able to come to class. So that's our biggest change. And we're going to have an online Masters in Foreign Language Teaching starting next year. So, well, we think it might start next year, but it's in the it's well, it's being developed right now. So, obviously, those courses will they will be courses that you can take face to face if you're on campus, but you can also take them online. Do you have any like support for any of the work you're doing? And if not, is there anything you particularly would like? 
Um, yes and no. I mean, MSU is a strange place. It's very different from, from uh, I was at the University of Arizona before, where I felt like they were more of a centralized, cohesive, coherent technology support across campus. Michigan State does not have that. There's a bunch of offices across campus that all do technology, and they do it well, but they don't seem to talk to each other, and they seem very disconnected. So the library does have a lot of things, but they're not where I go first, which is another reason why I'm going to do the call course so that the students have to consult all of these different places on campus and bring that back, because they obviously all teach different things. One place that I have utilized before is um, the virtual university, which is um, an office on campus that helps instructors put courses online. And they've been very helpful. For example, they have developed a sort of a, I don't know, a quiz, an entrance exam into a blended course. So they log into the course management system, and then they have to complete these set of tasks using a course management system and all the technologies that you will use in the course. And if they, you know, if they get through it, then they can start working on a course. If not, they have to get more technology expertise. Because we're, we get students that sign up for these online courses that, you know, checking their email is hard for them. And we can't support that. So um, that's why we, that, that was a really neat tool. I've used that um, a few times. Uh, I have been doing a cyber security, I call it cyber security project, mm -hmm. between my class and the class in the, uh, at the university in foreign countries, mm -hmm. in my case, Japan. And then I, I have been trying for telephone time mm -hmm. for hosting, and then had a difficulty for set up the time. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was, uh, have been thinking of individual uh, kind of contacts, like a Skype. Have you done that? Skype, um, we, we actually reverted to Skype a few times when we did our video conferencing because the audio didn't have as many yeah, problems. Yeah, that's, that's so that was, that was, that was good. Um, have you done another? We have, we've done tandem, tandem learning before too, but we <coughs> really did it text-based and not video-based because of the time difference. It just gets too complicated. So text-based, I mean, you can give a feedback or some students Yes. Well, they either did chatting, you know, mm -hmm. they, they, they chatted anytime they wanted with mm -hmm. them, or um, we did email exchanges, and one of my graduate students is doing another email project. Can you give some feedback or monitor how you know, They have to CC us or give us the transcript, so, oh, yeah, we do see it. I mean, sometimes they don't, and that's okay. I mean, they, they're supposed to talk about personal yeah. stuff, and if there's something in the transcript they don't want to show us, yeah, yeah, that's okay. That's fine, because they use German, so I'm happy. You know, just put dot, 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 and mm -hmm. I assume that you went off on something that I wasn't supposed to read. And that's another thing that, that um, we do with our courses that I didn't mention earlier, but um, we do, you know, use, we're not supposed to because we have blog computing rules, but we do use blog, and blogger, and blogspot, you know, Gmail stuff. We do use Google Docs and all of that, which is all of things we're not supposed to. And but we do it with this backdoor thing of, well, we create extra accounts, or we ask the students to create professional accounts. Just like I have a professional Facebook account and I have a private Facebook account. I have, like, I think 24 friends on my private Facebook, and that's it. And that's already too many, I think. Because <laughs> it's, it's, my rule is it has to be people that I, at least at some point in my life I communicate it weekly with and wanted to communicate weekly with. That's my rule for my private one. And then my professional one, I'm like, oh, you know, students, I don't care, you can be at it. And for example, right now it says, no, I think it said, it still has snow in the mountains in Colorado, so that was very exciting. But <laughs> um, it did say yesterday, office hours on Friday is canceled because I will be in Colorado. You know, I mean, my friends don't care. They're not going into my office hours. But so I have a separate account. I put links up there that I think are interesting for my students, either graduate students or undergrads. And we tell them, we show them by ourselves having their separate accounts, and then we also tell them, create separate accounts. I don't need, I just got another email this morning from pinkbunny at gmail.com, and I just don't need to get email from pinkbunny at gmail.com when you could be rogersn at msu.edu. 
we just we use it as an opportunity to teach them. Yeah, I, I have been using a blog and a class blog, and then I have my as a day we have been teaching a blog and the blog and then link into the one in blog and all sorts, and then it's just only for this class. You know? that yeah, that's what we did in 420. We had. We didn't have individuals, but we had small group yeah. blogs, and they picked a theme of, about which they blogged, and then they were all interconnected. And we, we also use Blogspot, which I think is very simple to use, which is why I like using it, but technically it's violating rules. But, and then right now I'm teaching a teaching methods course, and they also have to use this course, but they also have to use blog. And some of them are using their private account, and of course then they're using their nickname, and I'm supposed to grade it, and I don't know who MB is. Like, huh? I have several with those initials. I don't know which one you are, or it, it doesn't even have anything to do with their name, what they're calling themselves, so um, I had to tell them separate accounts. But they get used to it. They're getting more and more used to it. I was just curious when you um, were surveying the students to see who had personal computers or laptops and who didn't. Um, did you find uh, performance difference between students who did versus students who did have their own computers versus students that had to use like open labs on campus? Well, we have we have a computer requirement on campus, so technically every student on our campus is supposed to own a computer. So the percentage of people who didn't was very very small. And we, since it was an anonymous service, we didn't know how things related. But um, I think we ran, uh, I think we at some point ran whether it had a diff, made a difference for their overall technology skills, and I don't think it did. I don't think it was a significant difference. We did find differences in computer literacy between less commonly taught languages students and commonly taught languages with the less commonly taught language students having lower technology skills than the more commonly taught languages. And that work, that's, I mean, that's coming up at the end of the year. Do you offer fully online language courses as well? Like um, all Not right now, we have in the past, and we probably will again. When, when you do that, is it offered by your department or is it ran through no, a different not. school from it's you? Not. And actually, the online class that we had before was uh, Crystal Chim of Central University. Okay. And we probably will again, because like I said, the university will kick back the money. Mm -hmm. But right now, um, you know, for a little bit, when you face 24% budget cuts, you start getting a little greedy. So um, we think IEH courses, the general education courses, are the better courses to put online, because there's more students in them, meaning more money for us. So that's, that's sort of where we're headed. I mean, that's pretty realistic. But we're not quite as extreme yet as um, Arizona that had the 1,200 student course. So we're, we're still um, in the three digits. Sometimes even in the double digits. So we, we're, we're not, we have not gone, and I don't see any indication of us, other than in medicine. I think medicine and nursing, they, they probably will go in that direction, but um, in all the other areas on campus, I don't foresee us going to above 1,000 or even above 500. And are there departments like French or Italian, or are they also experimenting and offering blended courses? Yes and no. So we, we have three different language departments on our campus. We're, we're the everything, and then the others are separate. So Spanish and Romance languages are separate and then French and Italian is separate, but they're going to get merged, so really it's going to be cheap. And we are, I have to think about this, the Department of Linguistics and Germanic, Slavic, Asian, and African Languages, also the home of the MIT SOL program. That's who we are. So we're everything else, um, and the Lictal programs, and so on and so forth. Um, but we probably do a lot more with technology just because of the faculty that we have, and also our location. It's a little bit, it, it's interesting. I think location is very important. Process. Even though the others are in the same, but currently, this is all going to change, but currently the others are in the same building as the Language Learning Center, and we are not. We're in a different building. So we never use the Language Learning Center, which might be why we go blended, because we don't want to walk all the way across campus. It's a big campus, 20 minutes to go to the lab. I'm not going to walk there. Not with 30 students. So we just blend instead. 
And but we are closer to the second language studies program. We are closer. We used to be up until January in the same building as the Center for Language Education and Research. And then our college's educational instructional technology guy hangs out a lot over at where we are. So he helps us out a lot. So there is more technology expertise in our building than there is in their building, even though they have the actual lab. So I think that contributed kind of where things were going. Mm -hmm. And oh, I forgot. I have to. Um, so some of the tools you heard me talk about are developed by the Center for Language Education. There are some things that they develop that are especially for non-Roman script languages. So that might be helpful. And it's all free because it's Title VI funded. And then um, yeah, we also do offer workshops. And there's actually a workshop on blended learning that will happen. And this year, we will still have our workshops face-to-face. It looks like we will probably going to offer some online workshops in the future, just because budgets are tied everywhere and the likelihood of people traveling to us is probably going to increase. And so we travel to them. Any other questions, comments? What I, what I let them be in control of. Yeah. Um, so for example, and let's take 420 because that was my ultimate democracy now, of course. Um, they wrote the grading criteria with me. So they decided what they should be graded on. They were a lot stricter than I would have been. Um, then we had, so then we had situations that came up. For example, so they had to do two drafts of their projects and one person didn't turn in the second draft, only the first draft. So then we did a poll in class. What do you think we should do with this person? Should this person's first project version count as the final grade? Should it be only half that because draft two was not turned in? Should it be a complete zero? I mean, we had various, I asked them for recommendations and they came up with different ideas and then we made that and you know, here's the question and these are the five options and then they voted on it and that's what we went with. Which was nice for me because I wasn't the evil person anymore, it was the peers who were evil. So I, you know, I wasn't the one to blame. They peer grade, so they, they, you know, they learned a lot about what makes a good project because they had to grade others and think about it with the grading criteria that we co-wrote. They um, had the option of selecting from different plans within the syllabus that we had come up with. So you know, you can you can write this kind of a paper or this kind of a paper. There's four projects that you have to do, but you only uh, there's three you have to do out of these four. So that gave them options. We let them freedom with the topic. When we sent them out on on their little blended adventure, we gave them a, like I think it was like a 10-page worksheet, but they only had to complete like 70% of it or something like that. So they didn't have to do all of the activities but they could choose and they felt a lot more in control that way because they could focus on what they wanted to focus on. And is that something that happens in your class or in your department? Um, I don't think it has sort of spread out to everybody, but it's definitely spreading. And part of it is because of our liberal learning goals and that last one, the effective citizenship, that really has made us rethink a lot of things. But most of our, most of our faculty are really trying to push more control to the students and, and letting them decide and shaping the course. And sometimes they come up with ideas that you think, well that's crazy, but we'll try it. And sometimes they're genius. And you know, and sometimes the, if they're really just not realistic or something like you were saying where they're just trying to take the easy way out, then I cut them off and I say, hey, this is not a 400 level course project. We can't do that. You know, you have to produce longer writing. So I just shut it down at that point. But they accept it because they've seen me accept other things earlier in the semester. So then they're, they're fine with it. And I was just thinking of one other thing that we did. 
I'll remember it probably later. But there was something else that, that came up with their, with their independence. There's a lot of issues that come up, but you, but you really put them in charge that you couldn't anticipate before. Oh yeah, the self, so the, they have to do these self-evaluations, but we're still the teacher, so we still got ultimate power. So they fill it out, and then I can still change it, because there is always the student who thinks that they were terrific all the time. Yes, I talk to German all the time, even though you heard them talk English 80% of the time, right? Yes, I participated in, in full class discussion on oh, and hear you once. So you change those. And, and again, they accept that because you told them in advance. But then they also, they get a little bit better feel of where they're at. I mean, you start noticing that, you know, by week five, they're being more in line with what I would create them. And then I become more lenient. And again, yeah, maybe you had a good day and I missed it. But they also, because they get a self-evaluation form, they give us feedback. The first question is, what did you learn this week? Second one is, what did you like best? And the third question is, what do you wish? So it's three questions that give us information about how we're doing and how they're doing. What they learned, what they didn't learn. And it's really interesting because sometimes they really liked something that I didn't think they were going to like. Two weeks ago, they did. They had them. We read a novel, and the father dies at the end of the novel, but they don't know that yet. But the father will die right now. He's in a coma, and the son is finding out all these things about the father. And I told them that they should uh, work in pairs, and I assigned pairs, and they had to, which is unusual. Normally, I don't, but this time I assigned them according to their proficiency, and um, they had to go together into the lab and record a dialogue between the father and the son. So the father wakes up from the coma, now you have this conversation. It had to be true to the text, but it could expand beyond the text. And they loved it. And I thought they were going to hate it because they had to find time with a person that they didn't choose, and they had to sit in front of one microphone, and I thought they were going to hate it, but they really, I mean, almost all of them thought that that was their favorite part of that week. So they surprise you, which is why I do say sometimes it's time to play and just experiment. That's the main thing, just play. See if they like it, if they like it, good, if they don't, you know. I always try it two times though. So I have two batches of students that have to suffer. The first one, maybe it was just them, or maybe I didn't know how to use the tool yet, so I'll use it one more time, and if they still hate it, then it's the tool. Or I'm not good enough to use the tool. So two trials, and then you're out. More questions? Concerns? All right. Thank you. Thank you.